So good evening and welcome to the first in the new Lit Talks series presented by the Iowa City Book Festival and the Iowa City Public Library. My name is John Kenyon and I'm the Executive Director of the Iowa City UNESCO City of Literature Organization and I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening. So during the 2018 Iowa City Book Festival, we saw overwhelming interest in authors who explored issues of political and social engagement. Ari Berman, Art Coleman, or excuse me, Art Cullen, Dan Kaufman, Sylvia Hidalgo, all drew enthusiastic and engaged crowds. And just by show of hands, who made it to any of those events? All right, well, the rest of you missed out, but you're here tonight, so that's good. <laughs> so wanting to build on that and take advantage of opportunities that fall outside of our usual early October schedule, we created Lit Talks. The idea of this occasional series is to shed light on the issues of the day and to promote the ongoing community dialogue about those topics and to do so with authors from across the political spectrum. We're pleased to kick off this series with Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who will discuss his new book, Shortest Way Home, One Mayor's Challenge and a Model for America's Future. In it, Buttigieg, the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, a veteran of the war in Afghanistan, a Rhodes Scholar, and a newly declared candidate for the Democratic nomination for president, tackles issues that will be familiar to those of us living in a Midwestern college town. Overloaded sewer systems, problems with traffic flow, what to do with vacant buildings, and more. Buttigieg uses these civic problems and his data-driven solutions to make larger points about how we have tackled our challenges as a country and how we might do so more effectively in the future. So tonight, Mayor Buttigieg will be talking about his book, and I'm going to follow with a couple of questions here from the front, and then we'll open it up for audience questions. We'll be coming around with a handheld mic during that period. And as I would like to note, we are very blessed in Iowa to be able to meet and see in person many presidential candidates. And when we can do so, we can learn about the issues and where they stand on those. And to be able to do that, we ask a lot of questions. So when we have succinct questions, we can ask more of them. <laughs> okay, so all of you clapping, I hope you'll help me police this. So, Think about that when you are asking your question, when you're thinking about your question, so we can all get a lot of questions in for Mayor Pete. And I wanted to make sure that you're aware our friends at Prairie Lights are on hand selling books. And uh, what we will do at the end, and I'll remind you again, is if you buy a book outside, we'll have uh, Mayor Buttigieg up here uh, signing books after the event. So without further delay, I would like to ask you to help me welcome Mayor Pete Buttigieg to Iowa City. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Well, thanks. Good evening. Thanks for coming out uh, on a chilly night that I assume was arranged to make me feel at home. Um, <laughs> thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, I think I'll be brief. Uh, and maybe the best thing to do uh, when invited to discuss my book is just to share a few pieces of the book rather than talk about it while it's right here. Um, but I'll confine that to maybe three uh, or so short passages to give you a flavor for the themes I was trying to write about. Uh, and then we can get into a conversation. Uh, pretty quickly. Let me, uh, let me also just mention that this library, uh, and I've been seeing a lot of libraries lately, uh, really uh, is the envy of a lot of cities and mayors of, of communities this size. And uh, recently had the chance to review a, a book called Palaces for the People, which is, among other things, about the role that, that libraries can play. So uh, really delighted to be uh, a part of the uh, story of this, this Iowa City Public Library. Um, I wrote the book before it crossed my mind that I would be entering the 2020 conversation. And I really wrote it because uh, of, of a personal need and a public need. The, the personal need was uh, to try to make sense of a story that had pulled me in kind of a spiral uh, out further and further out into the world and overseas, and then eventually uh, right back home, uh, living literally five minutes walk from the hospital where I was born. And I was trying to make sense of that and see if I could uh, explain that in a, in a single story. Uh, and a public need, which was that I noticed that uh, my part of the country, and I would, I would say our part of the country, was being caricatured a little bit, was being regarded as, uh, as backward-looking and unable to accommodate change. And so I wanted to share a story of a community, our community, uh, that faced change in an honest way, uh, that confronted some of the, uh, the blows that we experienced over the last 50 years as a result of some of the economic shocks that came our way and came out ahead of it. Uh, so again, you can, uh, you can read faster than I can talk, and so I won't uh, subject you to too much um, uh, description of the book, but I'll just read you a few 
pieces of it that maybe give, give you a flavor for what I was trying to do. Um, one thing I'll do is I'll, I'll um, mention a bit the, the generational angle because I think uh, uh, being part of the sort of elder, I'm, uh, according to Wikipedia, by about three weeks I make it into the millennial generation. Um, and I think there's a unique perspective uh, that comes with that. So I, I want to share some of what I wrote about that. To be born in 1982 is to be just old enough to remember the Soviet Union and to have its fall be the first seismic geopolitical event of your lifetime. I remember the kid who dominated second grade show and tell with a little chunk of the Berlin Wall, gray and rough on one side but smooth and painted on the other, a trophy from his father's business trip to Europe. And there was Miss Martin repeatedly explaining to us why our maps and globes with Union of Soviet Socialist Republics spread in impossibly stretched letters across the Siberian tundra were now obsolete. Coming into the world in the early 1980s puts you in that senior segment of the millennial generation that still remembers life before the smartphone. Today I couldn't tell you the number of the phone on my own desk. But I still know my friend Joe's number from the sixth grade because I would punch it daily after school on a phone we had not yet learned to call a landline. <laughs> if I dial that number even today, one of his parents will still pick up. I'm young enough that I don't always use a TV set to watch television, but old enough that you might catch me using the phrase flat screen TV, <laughs> as if they sell any other kind. Only now can I make sense of the way my grandparents' generation used to talk of color TV long past the time when you could find a black and white TV for sale anywhere in America. From my freshman dorm room in late 2000, the most high-tech thing I did every morning was log on to South Bend's WNDU.com and look at the two-inch square low-resolution still image from the webcam on their transmission tower aimed at the Golden Dome, updated every few minutes, a grainy but comforting link to home. Websites didn't have much to them back then. I can see myself telling my grandchildren one day. But things moved quickly. By senior year, as I was banging out my thesis on an early Model I book, a few sophomores in another dorm were creating a website patterned after the Facebooks that Harvard passed out at the beginning of the year so that we could figure out who was who in the dining hall. Um, as John mentioned, a lot of uh, what's in the book is about uh, city government and, uh, uh, by extension, government uh, more broadly. Um, it would be difficult to, to pick out one or two spots here in the book, but we can certainly talk to that more in the Q&A. Um, maybe I should move on to an, another part of the book, probably uh, my favorite, which is more personal. So the book is uh, a love story about my relationship with my city, but, it, but it's also, among other things, a, a love letter to Chaston, my husband, who's, who's here, actually. He's the, um, Good-looking fellow in the blue sweater back there. Um, <laughs> uh, I write about the, some of the perplexities of coming out in Mike Pence's Indiana in 2015 <laughs> uh, in the middle of a re-election campaign, um, and there were many. Um, but arguably even trickier was figuring out how to go about having a personal life. And, and so I'll just read you a couple paragraphs about the beginning of the process that led me to Chaston. I had come out of the closet in order to make it possible, at last, to create a meaningful personal life. I was already well into my 30s and hoping to have a family someday. The politics were what they were. Now that I didn't have to worry about being spotted or outed, it was time to start dating. But how? How is a gay mayor, or any mayor, supposed to go about getting a date? The closer to home I looked, the harder it seemed. It could be an ethical minefield. A mayor in his own city can certainly get his calls returned, but there's also the risk that someone will completely misunderstand why you're inviting them to meet for a coffee at Chicory Cafe or a pint at Fiddler's Hearth. <laughs> Farther afield, friends from college were willing and eager to introduce me to the people they knew. But most of the eligible guys in question lived in New York or Washington. To most of them, I was lost in the expanse of so-called flyover country probably even more remote than if I were overseas. Since I wasn't moving anytime soon, I was going to have to think closer to home. But when it came to South Bend, it wasn't even clear where to look. I thought of the countless local doctors and business leaders of my parents' generation, who had seemed intent over the years on fixing me up with their bright and lovely daughters. Where were these would-be matchmakers now? And how was it that not one of them had a son or a nephew they wanted me to meet? <laughs> My city had never felt so small. 
Obviously, that story has a happy ending, but you can read about it. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, lastly read just a couple paragraphs that, that kind of are from the last chapter that sums up the case about the book, what I think South Bend's story has to do with the country as a whole. I never did see those factories off Main Street and Indiana Avenue throbbing with activity or the thousands of people who worked there pouring into Robertson's department store on a Thursday evening for a family night out. If I had ever witnessed the Studebaker Assembly Building as a hive of production, instead of as that silent hulk overshadowing our baseball park, maybe I would dream of nothing but restoring it to its original use and former glory. But for a generation that knew it only in its post-1963 decay, the building's potential as a home for data centers and glass-walled tech company offices is more vivid and believable than any thought of a return to its automaking past. Progress could begin only once loss had been fully metabolized. Nothing is more human than to resist loss, which is why cynical politicians can get pretty far by offering up the fantasy that a loss can be reversed rather than overcome the hard way. This is the deepest lie of our recent national politics, the core falsehood encoded in Make America Great Again. Beneath the impossible promises that coal alone will fuel our future, that a big wall can be built around our status quo, that climate change isn't even real, is the deeper fantasy that time itself can be reversed, all losses restored, and thus no new ways of life required. And again, I believe that South Bend's story is one of how we take that cha change on board, we, we recognize it, we take it seriously, uh, but we don't accept the idea that it means that we have to be a dying community and in instead concentrate on finding ways to make that change work for us. So that, um, in a nutshell, is uh, a little bit of what I was uh, up to with the, with the project. Uh, but look forward to having a, a bit of a discussion now. Sure. Great. So I wanted to start, you know, you've been asked countless times about whether you're too young to run for president. I'm not going to ask that question. <laughs> but I do want to ask, aren't you too young to write a memoir? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what's more presumptuous, running for president or writing a memoir, right? But, but I guess I didn't mean it to be a, a memoir as much as a, a story or a set of stories. And, and again, in many ways, the main, main character in the book isn't so much me as the city. And I think the city's got a, a very powerful story to it that should resonate across the industrial Midwest and, and maybe in rural communities too. Mm -hmm. And as you're writing in the book about those uh, civic problems or challenges that you faced, you know, in some ways those can feel very far removed from some of the challenges that we face as a country when we think about immigration, when we think about economic development, when we think about climate change. Um, so how scalable is the experience of a mayor dealing with those issues that you deal with in South Bend to think about dealing with some of those yeah. larger challenges. Yeah, needless to say they're different, but, but I also think there's a lot of affinity between executive leadership in government, including being a mayor at any size, and the demands of something like the presidency. Look, nobody walks into the Oval Office uh, with uh, any real personal sense of what it is like to have that job. Uh, and yet every one of the 45 people we've put in there has been a person with some combination of experiences in their background. And uh, the experiences you have as a mayor, I think, are, uh, uh, they really speak to what I believe is the threefold function of an executive job. And uh, part one is to pass and implement good policies. Part two is to uh, capably run an administration. And part three, probably the most important, even though it's the uh, hardest to describe, is this intangible role of, of drawing people together in difficult times and, and summoning people to their highest values. So in that sense, uh, of course, there's a big difference between uh, you know, uh, figuring out a wastewater policy um, and, uh, and conducting the ship of state. On the other hand, uh, I would argue that uh, the, the sorts of things that, uh, that I have to do, for example, in incidents uh, more than once where uh, we've had a potentially racially explosive officer involved shooting and having to hold the community together after that uh, are maybe not that different from uh, responding to other national emergencies. 
uh, that the work we've done around economic development and balancing the competing interests of the, of the private, public, social, and labor sectors, uh, uh, and making sure that those sum up to a, a shared interest instead of a competition, isn't that different than some of what needs to be done in terms of our national economy? So in the end, I think when, when you're, you're the one who gets that call, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, Iowa City's mayor is in, in the room too, so I want to acknowledge that and um, uh, thank you for being here. Um, you know, yeah. <clears throat> A little biased because of the Notre Dame degree, but uh, 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 don't hold that against them if you're not from South Bend. Um, but, uh, you know, you're, you're, I don't mean to say that they're similar, but, you know, you could be a, a very senior United States senator and have never in your life managed more than 100 people. Uh, but I think guiding a community, managing a workforce, implementing those policies and pulling people together, uh, maybe we need more, not less of that in Washington right now. Mm -hmm. So it's about leadership and putting the right people in the right place. As well, yeah, it's them. hugely yeah. important. Yeah. Good. Um, so one thing I also wanted to hit upon, uh, and you talked about it a little bit in the section that you read, is that um, while your age can be held against you by some folks, you've also experienced things firsthand that some of the other folks uh, in the field have not. I mean, mm -hmm. You've mentioned in the book that you're part of the generation that is dealing with more frequent school shootings. Right. Uh, you're dealing with the effects of climate change, you know, and, and thinking about how that's going to impact you long term. Um, how do things like that, that perspective that you bring to this, how does that set you apart from others who are in the field? And, and what do you think that will be in terms of a benefit yeah. uh, for you moving forward? Yeah, I think about this a lot. And, and part of this project is, is the idea of generational change. Uh, and it's not that you have to have a, a young candidate to reach younger voters any more than you have to have an older candidate to reach older voters. But I do think that um, you can speak with a certain sense of urgency when you can describe these issues as personal. And so when you belong to the school shooting generation or when you belong to the generation that furnished most of the troops after 9-11, um, when, uh, uh, when you're concerned as a personal matter with what's going to happen next with climate. It's one of the reasons on the trail I talk a lot about the world in 2054. Uh, all of us should care about what it'll look like, but um, I think about that number for me because that's the year I would reach the current age of the current president. And if, if you take the question of what the world will look like then personally, as something you're specifically personally individually preparing for, uh, I think it gives you a certain sense of urgency when you're describing these issues publicly too. Just as an interesting side note, I was telling my 13-year-old son about you making that point about 2054, and we figured out that he will be the age I am right now wow. in 2054. So it added some interesting perspective yeah. to what you were talking about. So I'm guessing uh, if you guys are the Iowa Cityans I know and love, you have plenty of questions for the mayor. So I am going to put on hold my segment here, and I will head out into the audience and Sounds get good. some questions for I you. I think I'll get on my feet just to be sure I can, I can see folks. Better. All right. I saw one question here first. Now, I know we have a lot of folks. I'm going to try to get around and balance it out. So <laughs> be patient with me. Thank you. I'm Clara Olson from West Branch, Iowa. And I'd like to know um, your attitude and your action plan for the 15,000 detained children at the southern border. Have you been down there? Have you seen them? If so, what did you see? If not, why not? So and I've not had a chance to, uh, to visit the facilities, but I uh, certainly hope to. And, is, it, uh, is it too much to say that this is an American concentration camp in the making? You know, I, I, think, I think that's not wrong in terms of how we ought to think about it. Look, Separating families is uh, gratuitous cruelty. It does not make us safer. Uh, and by the way, one thing that I believe has made us safe over the years, one thing I felt made us safe when I was deployed with an American flag on my shoulder was the idea that that flag represented a certain level of moral authority. If we sacrifice that moral authority, then we become less safe in more ways than we can count. Uh, we cannot accept this policy of family separation. I think it's revealing that even though it's clearly the doing of this president, even he pretended not to be responsible for it. Uh, so even this White House understands that it's wrong, or at least that it's indefensible, and yet it persists. Uh, so, uh, and, and frankly, it's not going to be a simple thing to reunite these families uh, because it's been so bungled in the way it's been handled. Um, there's a broader matter of comprehensive immigration reform uh, versions of which have, have passed the Senate only to be killed in the House. I fear the reverse may happen now where the, the House might pass something sensible and the Senate won't even take it up. Um, but we have to have comprehensive immigration reform. And I don't care what agency is in charge of the border. If it is given immoral policies in order to conduct them, 
then we are going to have a, a crisis of moral authority of our own making. Also regarding immigration, uh, my name is George Sauerberg. Uh, I live in Iowa City. Uh, will you reverse the uh, <clears throat> refugee cap and also uh, the matter of AB in which Jeff Sessions changed the uh, criteria for um, asylum seekers that uh, excluded uh, people uh, who are victims of gang violence and domestic violence. Right. Uh, I think that we can accommodate refugees and be better for it. Uh, matter of fact, my community is better for it. So uh, we have East African refugees. Uh, we have Iraqi refugees uh, in our community. And uh, you know, there, a lot of it's, by the way, faith-based, uh, the resettlement that goes on. And I was very disappointed in our then governor, uh, Mike Pence, and said so when uh, he started uh, attempting to restrict Indiana's sense of welcome for those refugees. Uh, we can look at what a reasonable level is, but I think it's uh, safe to say we're not at a reasonable level right now. And I think we do need to uh, contemplate gang violence. Look, if, if somebody is fleeing what we are fighting, then as much as we reasonably can, we ought to have their back and be there for them. And when it comes to refugees, this is a big part of how America has been able to recruit some of the best and brightest people in the world. Uh, they're not here to take anything. They're here to build lives, and they have contributed immensely. Uh, you know, I mean, you could think through history. Um, goodness, you could argue that that's how Einstein came to be, came to be here. Uh, it's, it's not a complicated argument. He was a refugee uh, from violence in his time, uh, and America represented a beacon of hope that would welcome somebody like that. By the way, at a time when many people would have an attitude toward Jews fleeing Europe that's not so different than the attitude that uh, uh, some are having us, trying to get us to take, uh, toward people fleeing violence in Central America or the Middle East. We've met, but I'm Barbara Clark. Hello I again. realize I hadn't really introduced myself. Yeah. My question is, if you were president in this very moment, yeah. what would your policy be for the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela? Yeah. So, look, I, I do believe that uh, the Venezuelan regime has lost its legitimacy. And uh, I think there's a reason that uh, something on the order of 50 countries uh, no longer feel able to recognize the legitimacy of the regime. Where I part ways with this administration is the idea that, that you can rattle the cage and threaten military force. By the way, some of the same people who were involved in the Iraq misadventure um, now signaling in not so subtle terms that they would uh, support the use of US force, which uh, you know, as a general rule does not have the best track record when it comes to regime change. Uh, now I think sanctions can play a role as part of that portfolio of American foreign policy tools, but those sanctions should be targeted in particular targeted toward uh, people who are corrupt beneficiaries of, of the regime. Uh, and they should be targeted with a purpose, and the purpose is free and fair elections. Venezuelans need to resolve this uh, on their own. There needs to be self-determination. Uh, but that needs to happen in the context of, a, uh, of an election that will provide domestic legitimacy and then, uh, I, I trust, uh, lead to a regime that will have more international standing too. Sir? Hi, I'm Harry Olmstead. Um, besides wanting to sit in the White House and in the Oval Office and Commander-in-Chief and President, why do you want to be President? <laughs> so, I don't think you run for any office because you think you'd like to have it. Uh, especially executive office, uh, which is so demanding and it really matters that it's one person and not another. And look, I did not guess uh, at any time in up until uh, fairly recently, that this is what I would be doing uh, at a time like this in my life or in our country's history. But what I've realized is that we're at a moment of, of tectonic social and political change. One to the point that right now, even now, we may be underreacting to the moment. And I think it calls for leadership that is different than what we've had. And that's why I think the perspective of a millennial Midwestern mayor uh, might be the kind of non-traditional background that would serve us well. Uh, millennial for reasons we've talked about, why a different generation ought to put forward leadership. Uh, Midwestern because, especially in my party, uh, we've sometimes failed uh, to connect with the middle of the country. And uh, again, th this book is a competing narrative uh, that, 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 that is attempting to serve up a counter-argument for the idea that the formula for the middle of the country is, is nostalgia and trying to turn back the clock. Um, and mayoral because I think, uh, you know, for all the tradition of, 
uh, of looking to Washington for, for leadership. I think that uh, in many ways, maybe something a little different from, from what we see uh, in, uh, in the U.S. Congress would, would serve us well. Um, and because I think these issues are, are too important, not just the policy issues, but the question of values. At a time when, when our party, our side of the aisle, I think has gone straight into litigating policies and uh, been somewhat uh, out, outlapped, outmaneuvered by conservatives who really tried to win the debate over ideas and values, such that even Democrats wound up enacting policies that were more conservative than not. And if we want to really pull the center of gravity back to a more reasonable place, um, then that involves trying to organize not just around an office or an election, but around an era. Uh, but the best way to set the tone for how we approach the coming era um, the kind of official way that that gets negotiated in the American public space is the American presidential election. And so it's, it's the best place I can think of to put forward this vision um, and hopefully to enact the, then the kind of policies that are consistent uh, with that vision and those values. Thank Great. You. We've got one back here and then I'll come back to the other oh. side. Hello, my name is Tegan Rader. I'm from Iowa City. And uh, you sort of touched upon this in the previous question. But I was curious, in your opinion, what do you think the Democratic Party lacks in connecting with Midwestern mm. and values, more or less? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of soul searching in the party about the answer to that question. I think the answer largely lies in communities like ours. And uh, by the way, I don't think it has to do with pretending to be more conservative than we are. Um, I don't think that it has to do with retreating from our commitment to racial justice, uh, which some would say is, is, is the way to win in the Midwest. Um, I do believe, though, that it means having a more inclusive account of what we care about. It's why I talk a lot about freedom, because I'm trying to make sure we have, we have an understanding of freedom, not just in terms of freedom from, uh, which is very much looking to government as though it were the only thing that can make people unfree, and instead talk about positive freedoms, the freedom you gain if you're able to organize uh, for fair conditions at work, the freedom you gain if you have health care coverage, and so you can make uh, more career choices than if you rely on your employer for health care, uh, the freedom that we gained uh, to marry people we love, uh, thanks to a single vote on the U.S. Supreme Court. These are the kinds of freedoms, I think, that, um, that decide whether our lives go well or poorly. And so what I want our politics to do is return to that level uh, that is both higher and lower altitude than what we usually do, which is policy. Higher altitude in that we're talking about our highest values, like freedom. But nearer to the ground as well in that we defend and justify all of our ideas, principally by reference to what they mean in everyday life. Uh, if we can't explain a policy, or for that matter a politician, in terms of why they would make your life better every day, then we've missed the point of politics uh, because political choices make our lives better or worse. This is kind of a mayor's eye view because you know, we know that if we pick up the trash or plow the snow well or poorly, uh, we are shaping people's life choices. Um, that's the level where I think we also stand the best chance of reaching across the aisle uh, in terms of voters. It's very hard to reach across the aisle in terms of politicians right now. Um, but I do think there are a lot of people, I know mathematically that there are people where I live who voted for Donald Trump, Barack Obama, Mike Pence, and me. <laughs> and so what it tells you is people are not as ideological as, as the punditry would have you believe. Uh, and that to me means there's an opportunity to vindicate our values um, by reference to everyday concerns that all of us can relate to. Hi. Uh, thank you for your comments so far. Joe Galbraith is my name. A uh, question for you relates to um, the uh, unending assault we've had on uh, topics like science and intellectualism and uh, environmentalism, et cetera. The list goes on and on and on. Yeah. Uh, and, and my question to you is how would you approach trying to reverse that and how would you deal with the conversation you're going to have between now and a time you, you much might get elected mm. where you might be the target of some of the very negativism that we're trying to address. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, um, you know, in many ways, the enlightenment is on the ballot, right? Do, do, do we care about what we have learned about the world around us or not? And of course, the central area where this is being played out is over climate. Um, the thing is, if, if you ignore the facts and if you don't follow the facts where they lead, 
uh, eventually you get run over. And I'm afraid that's happening today on climate. So maybe 10 years ago, it was still possible, uh, and you saw it, to educated people in positions of responsibility with a straight face to say that either climate change was overblown or that uh, there was no need to prioritize doing something about it. Um, but now, I mean, having, having found myself in the emergency operations center of my city 18 months apart, twice in two years, for what should be a once every several hundred years kind of flood. Uh, and you know, a lot of people in Iowa know, know about those extreme weather events. Um, to have parts of California catching fire. Uh, and to have, uh, when I go to a, a meeting of fellow mayors, to have all the Florida mayors worrying about sea level rise. Today, not as a theoretical thing, today. Then at a certain point it becomes like the argument over cigarettes, where uh, my friend the vice president said cigarettes don't kill. Put it in writing. Long past when we knew better, but, but there's that moment when Coyote runs off the cliff in the Roadrunner cartoon, but he hadn't looked down yet, right? And we're right on the bubble of that. And so unfortunately, it's come to the point where the best thing we can do is point to the real harms of ignoring those facts uh, and appeal to, to the sense of, uh, of common sense that, by the way, is totally there among American voters. Not everybody, but I mean, the center of gravity among American voters is there. The question is, if the center of gravity of American voters is there, why isn't the center of gravity of the American Congress there? And the, the reason, of course, is that our democracy has been warped by money and politics, redistricting, and a whole bunch of other things. All right, so I've got one here, and then I'm going to hit the other side of the room here. So. Hi. Um, I'm a student at the University of Iowa, and my question is how your book provides a very compelling argument um, for um, relating your kind of town's politics to the highest office, but how do you propose to make that same comparison to people who don't, who aren't from cities like yours, who are from, like I'm from a town where doctors and lawyers retire, <laughs> um, and and they they would not understand a word you said. And right. how do you propose to, I guess, help them understand? Yeah, I think we we need to appeal to common sets of experiences. So. Part of what I try to do, I describe a very specific experience of my community and the way it reacted to these changes. But I try to describe it in a way that hopefully uh, relates to how all kinds of different communities are facing changes. You know, I go to some communities, uh, well, some of them are here in Iowa. Uh, this weekend I'll be in Texas, say in Austin, another example, a community with problems that I would love to have, right? Explosive growth, off the charts. Um, but that creates real problems too. Right? So, so my, my friend, the mayor of Austin, is dealing with what happens when you have people absolutely flocking to your city and pr housing prices go through the roof. Uh, I'm dealing with, with houses that have become unaffordable because their prices are too low to get a loan on them. Right? You've got neighborhoods in my city. I know this is true in many communities around here. You get a perfectly good house for 40000 bucks or one that needs a little bit of fixing up. And some banks don't think that they'll ever see their transaction costs back, so they won't give you a loan. So weirdly, if the price of the house were higher, it would be easier to get a loan on it. And it shuts a lot of people out of the project to want to fix their homes. This issue does not compute when I'm in uh, LA or San Francisco or Washington yeah. talking about housing problems, right? So it's not just like this issue of this community and that issue of that community. It's about uh, an approach to problem solving that follows the facts where they lead, uh, even if being pragmatic and doing that takes you to a place that we've been told is radical, um, and doing it with a view toward our, our lived experience in everyday life. And I think the more we can express our politics and our policies, in terms of lived experience, through narrative, the, the way good political speech works, right? The way good writing works. It's telling a story that helps you picture the world through somebody else's eyes. Then that's when I think, that's when I think politicians can earn our paychecks, actually, the most. Um, because that has the capacity to take people of, of radically different experiences and help them see that they're part of the same project, part of the same experience. And I really believe in politics as a way to do that. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Thank you. Got one here in the back. Great. My name is Amin Vahedian. I'm from Tabriz, Iran, and I would like to ask you about your Middle Eastern policy, specifically the Iran deal and Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace talks. Yes, Mukabil Tan Um So we've got to relate to the entire world in one of two ways. We can either resent the rest of the world or we can seek to lead the rest of the world. We can't do both. And uh, you know, this idea of America first, in my view, really means America alone. Every country puts its interest first. That's its job. 
Um, but when you do it in a way that excludes the well-being of other people uh, or assumes that a gain for another nation comes at our expense, then you are sowing the kind of division that makes the world a more dangerous place. Um, you know, I'm non under no illusions about the complexity of issues in the Middle East, uh, whether it is uh, our ability to relate to the people of Iran or the uh, growing tension between Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, in the competition for regional uh, uh, security dominance, uh, or for that matter, uh, uh, of course, what's happening in Israel and what's happening to the Palestinian people. Uh, what I do know is that uh, America can only be useful in resolving these tensions if it remains the case that American interests are aligned with American values. Uh, and I think every time and by the way, some of the unfortunate examples of why this is true come from Iran, as well as Afghanistan, as well as Iraq, um, as well as Latin America. Anytime we've thought that we could support American interests in a way that was contrary to uh, universally believed values that are also American values around human rights or self-determination, um, every time we've thought we could do that, we've, we've wound up paying for it later on. Um, or somebody has paid for it, and it's harmed the regard people have for our country. I believe in American values. I believe in democracy. I believe in pluralism. Um, I also believe that uh, those American values have to be aligned with American interests, um, or we might be fooling ourselves that we're acting in our interests. And by the way, once we make a decision to act on American interests and we check it against our American values, whenever possible, we should also be consulting with American allies. Uh, and uh, the uh, the tearing up of the alliances that have kept us safe may be the biggest thing that the next president will have to work on. is reestablishing U.S. credibility among our friends uh, before uh, we even think about uh, how to be more convincing in negotiations with our competitors. All right, we've got a couple questions back here, and then we'll move again. Uh, just a quick follow-up to that uh, previous question. In Congress today, there is legislation with bipartisan support which would criminalize the BDS support for the BDS movement. Do you have a position on that? Uh, so uh, that's a reference to the uh, boycott and divestment uh, uh, movement uh, relative to Israel. I, I haven't seen that legislation. I'll, I'll read about that when I get home tonight. Um, but uh, and that's not the approach that I favor. I do think that we need to recognize, and again, this is partly a generational thing. Um, because the unsustainable dimensions of the trajectory that uh, Israel and Palestine are on, those will come due in our lifetime. And they will be visited upon the heads of Israeli and Palestinian and perhaps American uh, people who are alive today. And so we need to, as you do with a friend, uh, put an arm around our Israeli friends and talk about uh, how we can have an adult conversation about a trajectory where, uh, uh, where there will be decisions to be made about uh, how to be a democracy and also be a Jewish state. Uh, this can't just go on forever. Uh, what's happening in Gaza cannot go on forever. Um, I don't know how much the U.S. is still regarded as neutral uh, in the Middle East. I don't know how much ability we have in that regard. Um, but I do know that we have enough influence and enough resources um, to guide better outcomes there, whether it's the way that our uh, Arab allies have uh, in many ways uh, sold out the Palestinian people, uh, or whether it's the way that uh, uh, our Israeli allies have uh, perhaps painted themselves into a corner. And by the way, I believe there's a conversation happening among uh, the Jewish community in America uh, that is perhaps more uh, open and forward-looking than we've had in my lifetime. Hello. Um, as president, what would you do to uh, combat suburban sprawl and auto dependency in transportation, especially in context of climate change? Yeah, it's, it's such an important question because we, we, we hear about climate change as though all the solutions have to do with uh, kind of industry or we have to think up technologies, which is partly true. Um, but so much depends on the way our communities are laid out. Um, and by the way, there are a lot of benefits uh, beyond just the environmental, to getting this right. One of the most unpopular things I did on purpose, until people could really see it, uh, was reconfigure some of the streetscapes in South Bend to try to make them more friendly to pedestrian 
uh, and bicycle traffic. Uh, and um, people were mad because it slowed down cars. But then afterwards, it was, it was actually great for economic development. Um, there's actually a, a straight line correlation if you look at public health data between the average vehicles, vehicle miles traveled in a county uh, and, and life expectancy. It's a negative correlation. Uh, and so there's a lot to be gained by having the right kind of density in our growth. And uh, part of that is taking into account the full life cycle cost of buildings. So if you have a big box store and a big parking lot and it's not built to last, um, and there's no accountability for leaving it behind after, after it's had its useful life, you're not really having an honest accounting for the cost. So uh, I guess the thing I would add to environmental policy, my contribution if, if I get to make one to the whole Green New Deal debate, uh, is in addition to R&D on bending the cost curve on solar, PV, and so forth, uh, one of the things we got to do is make sure that there's federal support to help cities uh, grow in a reasonable and sustainable way, uh, which also turns out to benefit uh, many more metrics on what I would call the triple bottom line, uh, social, economic, and environmental. Uh, and we see models for that from cities around the country, including my own. Um. Okay, so I'm Phil Tyne. 2020 is going to be the first time I'm allowed to vote, so Great. it's a uh, little new to me. But um, I'm curious as to how you're going to reach out to the Midwestern voters who voted for Trump, yeah. like through agricultural stuff and other things. Right. Um, so I think this is really important because uh, there are a lot of people, and this is something I also have a hard time explaining to uh, audiences sometimes that I visit in coastal cities. Uh, I think most of us, if you live in a uh, place like Iowa or Indiana, you, you know someone you love. Um, <laughs> they got that look in their eyes and, you know. And the thing is, a lot of folks who did that, as you've probably found when you're arguing in circles with them, um, it's, not that, it's not that they think he's a good guy. I mean, maybe some people do, but most people don't, which is why it's a fool's errand to think we're going to find the piece of evidence. Aha, this proves he's not a good guy. They know he's not a good guy. Um, but there was a decision, in many cases, I think a decision to vote to burn the house down because the system was letting people down. And our party felt like we were the defenders of the system. And that's one of the reasons I worry a lot about an emerging democratic message that basically goes like this. Um, What's happening in Washington is crazy, it's chaotic, it's unsustainable. Uh, uh, we can't go on like this. That's part A. Uh, therefore, part B, uh, we've got to go back to what we were doing before. We've got to restore normalcy. I'm on board with part A, but I don't think that part B gets it right. Because I think if people were happy with normal, a presidency like this one wouldn't even come close to being possible. It wouldn't even come within cheating vistas. Um, <laughs> So we've got to treat it as a symptom and ask about the causes. I think the democratic temptation to rewind to the Obama years or the Clinton years uh, is almost as, uh, as impossible as the conservative temptation to go back to the 50s. Um, we, so we have to offer people an account of the future that doesn't leave them behind. So that, kind of as I was writing about, so that it's less seductive to promise that nothing's ever going to change or that we can turn back the clock and instead of say, OK, there is change. This is how we got started in South Bend. Everybody was saying, can we get some version of the old auto factories back? Can you buy those jobs? Can you come up with some incentive and get the big plant and fix everything? Be like Studebaker again. And I had to talk about how nothing like that was coming back. But we are coming back, and here's how. And then we talked about a, a kind of economy that includes manufacturing but also branches out into industries that didn't even exist before. People want to know where they belong. They want to know how they fit. And that is as relevant to uh, an auto worker who's, who's been disrupted in the middle of his career as it is to a uh, trans kid in high school who just has to go to the bathroom like everybody else. People just want to know where they belong. And if we're offering that kind of message, then I think people will be able to hear us. And crucially, they will feel good not just about us, but about themselves when they come and vote our way. Um, hi, I'm Justin, Justin Ford from Iowa City. Um, assuming everything goes swimmingly well for, the, for, the, for a while, um, what's your um, position on pardons and why? Oh. 
I think I see where you're going with that. I'd say pardons are mostly useful for addressing racial disparities in nonviolent drug offenses. So that gives you some sense of how I would apply it, <laughs> um, as opposed to say, you know, things that threaten the integrity of the republic. Um, <laughs> But that's just, you know, a general observation. OK, we've got one here. Hi. Um, I first just wanted to thank you for creating a platform for um, LGBT people like me to be outspoken. Um, I am originally from Ferguson, Missouri, and I'm actually a Ferguson activist. Um, I do a lot with the Black Lives Matter movement, and I just wanted to know your thoughts um, about preventing another story. Sorry, I get emotional about it. Um, preventing another story where I don't want to see another Michael Brown. I don't want to see another Trayvon Martin. Um, I want especially uh, the black community to be comfortable in all spaces and be embraced. So I wanted to know how you would be outspoken against white supremacy of all forms that is normalized, especially in places like Iowa. And we don't like to talk about it. And instead, we like to cancel forums when we're supposed to have discussions about white supremacy because it makes people uncomfortable. Um, so I just overall wanted to see what you thought about, especially, especially in our own community, standing with black LGBT people yeah. and yeah. all forms. So well, thank you. Um, <laughs> Thanks, thanks, first of all, for your involvement and for your activism. Uh, look, we've learned a lot of lessons the hard way. And uh, there were many moments when I kind of, I, sh I should mention South Bend's a pretty racially diverse community. We're about 45% non-white. And uh, there were a lot of moments when I sort of lost my innocence as a mayor in my first couple of years, uh, confronting some of the issues that led to mistrust uh, between uh, communities of color and, uh, and law enforcement in particular. Um, which also, by the way, make it hard for the best law enforcement officers to do their jobs. Um, and so we've tried to do everything from uh, really energetically trying to move to build a more diverse police force ourselves um, to the kind of quantity time uh, that it takes in order to have the right kind of dialogue about this. Um, I think many of us may have believed wrongly that a lot of these racial issues had been conquered by a previous generation, because we thought we feel good about ourselves when we watch the trajectory of the civil rights movement and that sort of thing. And then we realize how much, not just unfinished business, but actual backtracking that there has been. And, uh, you know, first of all, there, there needs to be leadership at the highest levels that, that asserts that hate has no home in this country or in our communities, flat out. There, there, there is not something to be said for both sides at, at a neo Nazi rally. Um, there's just not. And we also, you know, I studied, I never thought I'd be thinking about this in a domestic context, but I studied counter-radicalization as a counter-terrorism officer. And part of how radicalization works is it exploits people's vulnerabilities, right? Um, and it's one of the reasons why, it's going to take me a minute to connect the dots here, but <laughs> it's one of the reasons I feel a, a real sense of urgency around the future of work and issues like automation and some of these things. Don't, I don't mean to say that economic issues can ever uh, or should ever be used to excuse racism. Mm -hmm. Let's get that very clear. I do believe that the, the loss of identity that people feel when they are disrupted, when you're in a world where you're, you're thrown from, you can no longer count on a lifelong relationship with an employer mm -hmm. you know, to explain who you are and how you fit. Um, we need as, as a society to offer productive alternatives for where we get our sense of identity. And there's some very productive alternatives to be had, like involvement in a community uh, or activism or, or some more conservative sounding answers like, like family and, and, and faith. That works too. Mm -hmm. If we don't, then some very ugly alternatives come in. Uh, and one of those alternatives comes in the form of, uh, of addiction. And another comes in the form of, of this moment we're in now that, that I would describe as white identity politics. Uh, and it's incredibly corrosive and damaging uh, to the individuals and to the collective. So we have to confront it with some of the same tools we have for counter-radicalization that, that, that we've used in, other, uh, in, in addressing how it happens in other parts of the world. Um, but it, it starts at the top, right? It starts with the tone. It starts with establishing what's okay and what's not okay. And it's part of what I mean uh, when I talk about the lessons I've learned in the job that as much as I like to believe as a policy guy and a data geek that this is about policies and rules and systems, um, that moral authority that comes with the office 
maybe the most important thing of all, and its absence right now may be the most damaging thing of all, more than any one policy. And it's one of the things that we can get right, uh, not just after 2020, but in the conduct of these campaigns. Thanks. Thanks. So we've got one over here. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jocelyn. I'm a student at the University of Iowa as well. Um, my question has to do with economic inequality and specifically the disproportionate way that wealth is distributed in America. Uh, how would you rebuild the middle class and how would you also ensure that no one in America is living in extreme poverty? Thank you. Um, think about this a lot too because even though I'm proud of the fact that uh, we've reduced, I mean, just in the last few years we've, we've lifted uh, more than a couple thousand people out of uh, at least the federal definition of policy in our community. Uh, I'm, I'm from a low-income community, and we still are. We're celebrating the fact that our per capita personal income just went over 20000 uh, And so we have a lot of people uh, in our community who look at the top-line numbers and the kinds of things the mayor wants to brag about, that unemployment's low and GDP's growing, uh, and say, okay, but that's not happening in my life. Um, by the way, it's not just income inequality, it's asset inequality. We did a uh, somewhat uncomfortable uh, body of research on ourselves and learned about the dimensions of what's called liquid asset poverty um, uh, and the number of people who don't have enough dollars to get them through an emergency. And the racial disparity on that is even more alarming than the racial disparity around income inequality. So what do we do about it? Well, first of all, we shouldn't be surprised that this happens when we disinvest in the engines of social mobility in this country. Uh, you know, you can count the American dream. Right? The one very simple way to count the American dream is how many people who were born in the bottom in income, uh, bottom fifth, make it to the top. And based on that number, today, the, the place to experience the American dream, the place you want to go if you want to live the American dream, is Denmark. <laughs> I like Denmark. I want them to be happy too. But I, that's alarming, right? I don't think we're even in the top five right now. Um, because we disinvested in public education and transportation and higher education and workforce development. And when you disinvest in these things, when you take out of them in order to, uh, among other things, finance unaffordable tax cuts on the wealthiest, um, there are consequences to that. Uh, and so lastly, you, you can't have a conversation about income inequality without talking about taxation. It's not all a matter of taxes and redistribution, but that's a really big part of it. And uh, if we're not prepared to uh, ask some people to pay more of their fair share, if we're not prepared to revisit the top marginal income tax rate, uh, if we're not prepared to entertain a tax on wealth, which to me is uh, no more unreasonable than property taxes, which is how we pay for most of what we do in the city, um, and maybe a financial transaction tax that actually addresses the preposterous wealth that's being made on uh, these minuscule millisecond differences that, from what I can tell, contributes nothing to the real economy. Right? Maybe there should probably be a tax on that. Um, and then we can use it, again, not just in a direct redistributional sense, but um, in order to finance the things that make it possible to get out of poverty, like education infrastructure uh, and, and the other resources that are at the basis of social mobility. Uh, so uh, obviously there's so many different angles to this question. Um, but if we don't address this question, um, we won't be healthy. You don't have to be poor to be worse off living in a country uh, where people face extreme poverty. That diminishes all of us. And so all of us need to be ready to play a part. Thanks. All right. We've got time for three quick questions. I have all three folks identified. Here's number one. You've touched on it a couple of times, but would you give a big picture of how you would address climate change? Sure. Um, so big picture. Let me talk about it in terms of the two pillars of the Green New Deal that I think make it a good framework. Number one, the concept of a Green New Deal correctly identifies climate change as a major national emergency. And it recognizes that the destructive power of climate change is comparable to that of a war or depression. And uh, I'm not sure we've officially formally acknowledged that as a country, but that's the big insight behind excuse me, the Green New Deal. And it's my, again, my personal experience of climate. Look, we had storms before we had climate change, but uh, not this often and, and not like this. The second thing that it does, and the reason I think it's kind of an elegant concept, 
is that it also notes the economic potential that lies in rising to deal with it. So you think about how this country got out of the Great Depression, how we dealt with the Great Depression. Big part of what ended the Great Depression was actually World War II and the national mobilization we underwent in order to meet that threat. I'd like to think, though, it doesn't take a war <laughs> for us to do that kind of national mobilization. So uh, what the Green New Deal gets right is that we can create more opportunity for more of us. By the way, especially in the middle of the country, whether we're talking about wind resources or the manufacturing that's going to be required for, you know, one of the biggest expansions of union auto worker jobs in my county uh, recently was to make electric vehicles for a company based out of Santa Clara uh, where most of the investment's coming from the Chinese. So how's that for a story about a globalized, automated, green economy in the 21st century, right? Union jobs in St. Joe County. That's what I want to see more of. And it's going to take R&D. And uh, it's going to take changes in the way we do things. We can still have cows, I promise. <laughs> um, but we got to ask about how our cities are laid out and how our transportation. By the way, how great would it be, it be if Des Moines and Chicago and South Bend and Louisville and Columbus and Cincinnati, these places were within two or three hour fast train I'm not even asking for. Yeah. Yeah. It would be good for us. I'm not even asking for Japanese level trains. Just give me like Italian level trains. <laughs> you know? um, so, you know, we don't have it all figured out. When people say, is 2030 the right year to meet these goals? I mean, scientifically, the right year is last year. Uh, so it's not a question of, you know, should we? It's a question of how fast can we make it happen? And the answer is, uh, however fast we're going, it's not fast enough. Uh, so we can quibble over how we're going to get there. It's admittedly more of a goal than it is a fully laid out plan, and that's okay. President Kennedy didn't have the rocket trajectories figured out when he said we're going to go to the moon. He believed in America, and he believed it was worth doing. And I believe in America, and I believe this is worth doing. So that's the high-level answer. Hello. Uh, I'd like to ask about um, your thoughts on the politization, politicization of the courts. Mm. Um, something that um, I first became aware of in Iowa about a decade ago. We were one of the first states that, that legalized gay marriage. Yeah. Thanks for that, um, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> we were very proud of it. I was, anyways. Most of us were. But, um, so, uh, but there was a backlash that we faced with, with yeah. the way I was set up. We have uh, judicial retention, and there was uh, yeah. a large movement um, uh, through, through, through the ballot box. You could try to remove some, judge, some judges. Um, and so I'm more than specific policies that you would have maybe to change the, the judicial system. I'm curious, you talk about winning the battle of val values versus yep. before you, before you, um, you know, have specific policy prescriptions, where do you prioritize, uh, the courts as an institution within, within American democracy? Yeah, it's, it's such an important question. And, uh, and part of what's at stake and your question touched on this is even, uh, if we win the battle of values and we start seeing legislation consistent with that, you can have this rear guard action. Uh, coming from courts that have been set up as basically a, uh, a, a sort of political uh, straitjacket uh, on what we can do. So I also think it's bad for the courts. I mean, it's not just because I think it's bad for progressive priorities. Obviously, I care about progressive policy. But it's about um, this danger to the republic if the courts come to be seen as a nakedly political institution, which I think is happening. And so the question to me is not so much today, you know, this policy or that policy, although I'm going to mention a couple of policies I think are worth a look. But the, the, the problem we got to try to solve is uh, how do we stop that politicization so that, you know, every vacancy doesn't become this apocalyptic uh, ideological firefight, uh, which is part of what motivated uh, basically the theft of a, a Supreme Court seat last time. Um, and, and made the stakes so high and also so ugly on this latest nomination fight. That's why some people are now calling for us to just add justices, just add in a couple. Um, and I get the sentiment of that. I'm worried about what happens when somebody else decides to do the same thing. So uh, a couple policies I've heard that are interesting. One would be to just um, do a rotation, bring people up from the appellate bench. Uh, and so it, it just lowers the political stakes a little bit. Um, the puzzle there, even on a lottery system, is how do you keep it balanced? Another way you could do it, uh, which you might call a 5 plus 5 plus 5, would be a policy where you have uh, 
five justices. All of this, interestingly, by the way, can be done within the Constitution. The number nine is not in the Constitution when it comes to the Supreme Court. A lot of people don't realize this. You can do some of this with legislation. Um, you have five uh, justices appointed by presidents of one party and five by another. And then the other five uh, are brought up from the appellate bench, but they can only be seated if there is a unanimous consensus among the other ten. And so what you would get, presumably, is justices who think for themselves. And in the past, you know, things like, well, things like my marriage uh, and, uh, and things like the, the right to choice in this country uh, came about because of Republican-appointed justices who thought for themselves. Um, given that it's less possible, sadly, for that to happen now, um, some structure like that might make it more likely for that to happen. So that might be the right answer, it might not, but I think it's time at last to open the debate. And also, by doing so, remind everybody that we should not be afraid to talk about structural matters. We've had plenty of amendments to the U.S. Constitution in modern times. I mean, taking the voting age to 18, uh, which will serve you well right here in this room. The 25th Amendment, which I'm afraid might come in handy one day. Um, the, uh, and, and over the years, we've, we've tuned up our democracy through constitutional process. So we're talking about things that require an amendment or some things in the court that you could just do by statute. Uh, let's have those conversations rather than take it as a given that we have to just buckle our seatbelts and keep, keep driving down this, uh, not to mix a metaphor, but this slippery slope that we're on. <laughs> All right, we've got time for one final question here. Hi, my name is Andy. I live here in Iowa City, but my wife is from South Bend, so oh, uh, we, we visit often and we're no strangers to the Chicory oh, Cafe. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, sometimes as an executive, whether you're a mayor or president, you set the agenda, but sometimes the agenda chooses you. And so I know that you, early on in your tenure, you faced an incident where the... Uh, where there were some unfortunate recordings made in the police department, and you had to make some executive decisions after that. And those didn't necessarily go the easy way, resulted in lawsuits and, that have lingered for years. I'm wondering, just a simple question, is there anything that you learned from that incident that could make you a better executive moving forward, and what is it that you learned? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I learned a lot. Um, and, I, and I describe it in the book so, so that I can explain it. I probably explain it better than I can um, in, in a quick order verbally. But to make a very long story short, uh, we had a, an episode where um, officers were using recording equipment to record other officers. Uh, this ran afoul of the Federal Wiretap Act. And within a few weeks of becoming mayor, I think before I got to the age of 30, um, I was uh, more or less informed by federal prosecutors that I could either fire uh, a popular, uh, well-liked African-American police chief um, or uh, see indictments uh, coming to the police department. And uh, really thought long and hard about what was most likely to tear the community apart as well as what was the, most, uh, uh, what was the right thing to do. Uh, and in navigating that situation, uh, learned a lot about uh, the main thing I learned was that people's concerns that deserve to be taken seriously uh, were not settled by me sort of showing I was right on the legal side. Um, and it sounds obvious, but it, sometimes you have to learn these things the hard way. Um, so this wasn't about the finer points of the Wiretap Act for the people who were concerned that these recordings might include uh, racial content. Um, but there was no way to find out because I wasn't sure I could even listen to them without breaking a federal law. So you can get a sense of the pickle I was in. Um, and it really came down to the question of whether the community felt it could trust the people who were sworn to keep them safe uh, and how officers felt about their relationship with the community. Um, so thankfully it didn't come by, by way of bloodshed like the reckoning that happened in Ferguson. Um, but it still was unbelievably painful for all of us. Um, I learned uh, to try to understand the story behind the story behind the story, which really had to do with the relationship or a fraught relationship with law enforcement and community of colors that uh, goes back at least to the civil rights era uh, and in many ways before, um, that a lot of the worst injustices uh, came at the hands of law enforcement. And every mayor and every police officer today, no matter who they are or what they're like, is still answering for that. 
And there's also connections between that past. It's not a historical artifact. There's connections between racism in the past and racism in the present. Um, and so I found myself answering for all of that. Um, didn't ask for it. Didn't understand it when it was served up to me. Uh, not by my choosing. But I guess the biggest thing I learned was that um, you can establish good faith. Sometimes it takes quantity time. I mean, to this day, there are lots of people who may take exception to the choices that I made. But I also wouldn't have won every uh, minority-majority district in our city in the re-election, in the primary and in the general, if, uh, if I think, if we hadn't been able to reestablish that trust. Um, and take a lot of steps to make sure that the community and the department and the neighborhoods um, all, uh, all felt like we were pulling in the same direction in the end. Um, and in many ways, that's when you learn what, what leadership is really about. It's not being right. Um, things where you can be right and prove you're right, those are technical issues. And you deal with technical issues when, when you're in government. Um, but what really matters is, is the moral issues. And, and winning, so to speak, a moral issue or navigating a moral crisis isn't about getting everybody to think you were right. It's about making sure that at the end of that crisis, more people have been called to what's best in them than at the beginning. And sometimes in a no-win situation like that, um, that's the best you can offer. And uh, I, I wish that we had leadership in Washington that understood those stakes uh, when it comes to approaching some of the most divisive issues of our time. Um, so on that cheerful note, <laughs> uh, I gather we're just about up. But I, I want to yeah. thank, uh, we'll, we'll hang around and, and do books and talk one-on-one -on -one if, if you get a chance. But uh, uh, I, I just want to reflect that um, it was remarkable to me how thoughtful and serious uh, the people who, who uh, I've met, even just across today, are. Um, sometimes they, they tell you when you go into another state, you know, you study the, the backyard issues in case you get a parochial question about, uh, uh, you know, something. And uh, I can tell folks here really take seriously the, the privileged, frankly, position that you have in evaluating people who put themselves forward for national leadership. Uh, and I admire the, um, the seriousness and, and the um, depth of the conversation. So thanks.